defense strategy. Uh, we covered it extensively, and that document really set a new and high standard in defense analysis for the United States. At the time, uh, Mr. Colby was Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Department of Defense in charge of uh, strategy and force development. Uh, Uwe Parpart, of course, is Asia Times editor. I should mention that he has extensive military background as an officer in the German Navy at the peak of the Cold War. He participated in many staff exercises and saw a great deal of the unfolding of the Cold War from the inside. The format today is really a conversation between uh, Bridge Colby and Uwe Parpart. Uh, I'll be listening along with the rest of you. Your questions uh, are important to us and uh, most eagerly solicited. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a Q&A button. If you have a question at any time, uh, please uh, write up your question. I will be reading them uh, and in some cases consolidated them to, for the sake of time. We'll go for about half an hour in the two-way discussion uh, and then break for questions. So with that, um, the floor is yours, gentlemen. Welcome and thank you very much for participating. Okay, David, uh, thank you very much for this uh, introduction. Uh, Bridge, it's a, a great pleasure having you on here uh, tonight in Hong Kong and this morning in uh, the uh, Americas. And uh, you know, hopefully we'll uh, present something to the audience that will give them some food for thought. Uh, the uh, way I'd like to introduce it is uh, by making two very brief sort of introductory uh, comments. Uh, the, uh, the theme is, uh, uh, as announced, uh, you know, what uh, might bring about a war in the Pacific, and uh, if, uh, God forbid, it were to happen, you know, who would, in fact, uh, perhaps win it? Uh, assuming that there could be an actual uh, winner in this kind of uh, engagement. The uh, reasons why wars start are multifarious. Uh, there's uh, uh, anything from religious wars in uh, the uh, uh, post-Middle Ages uh, to, uh, uh, you know, very uh, economically driven uh, wars uh, that we've seen uh, at different times in the, the uh, history. Um, what is going on at the moment in the Pacific that we should pay attention to in terms of a potential uh, casus belli, in terms of a cause for war? Um, there is the uh, so-called Thucydides trap theory uh, that's been developed that uh, you have a uh, situation in which uh, the uh, uh, new power, the uh, new power on the scene, in this case, China, is challenging the established power, in this case, uh, the United States. And under those circumstances, uh, some have said, uh, it is uh, near inevitable, uh, much as the contest between Sparta and Athens, uh, that indeed a, uh, a Bellicose outcome is going to be the most likely outcome. I'm not convinced of that, but uh, at any rate, you know, that's uh, what is uh, much of the thinking at this point in time. Uh, I have a couple of remarks uh, to make about that in terms of um, what I think is a likely uh, cause of war if there were to be one in the Pacific. Uh, during the Trump administration, in which uh, uh, Eldridge uh, served, um, the contest was uh, essentially an economic, financial uh, one. It uh, morphed into uh, uh, something, uh, you know, different and perhaps more ideologically shaded uh, at a later point. But uh, ultimately, it started with a situation in which uh, I believe uh, President Trump uh, felt that uh, the United States had been dealt a bad deal over the years and uh, this needed to be rectified. And that's why it became a trade war as opposed to a hot war. Um, 
those kind of wars, uh, I think one can actually resolve by making a deal. Uh, on the other hand, if it uh, becomes uh, something more of an ideological or even religious type of war, then uh, the difficulties arise and uh, this might be much more difficult to resolve. Uh, what is it at this point in time with the Biden administration? I think uh, from the emphasis on trade and economics, uh, the, con the contest uh, between the United States and China has uh, become more of a contest uh, over uh, systems, if you will, ideologically, uh, uh, perhaps expressed of, you know, democracy versus autocracy. Uh, a, a, a systematic or systemic uh, situation in which uh, it may be much more difficult to reach uh, actual agreements. And uh, from the Chinese standpoint, of course, uh, this is a situation in which they feel that the very way in which they are uh, actually uh, pursuing uh, their path to greatness is being challenged. And from the United States point of view, uh, democracy and republicanism as a principle, small r, uh, are the uh, actual uh, precepts uh, by which this is being fought. Uh, now, in terms of an actual war, what, would, what could and would cause a war? Uh, I think uh, that's been played through for, well, uh, at least since the 1950s. Uh, there have been near wars over uh, Taiwan uh, ever since the 1950s, ever since 1941, 49, excuse me, uh, when of the uh, foundation of the uh, People's Republic of China. And uh, there were various times of which there were actual military engagements over Taiwan. And uh, if there is to be any kind of uh, situation that leads to war, I think uh, this would be the most uh, likely cause of war. Uh, Bridge, if you disagree, please let me know. And uh, the uh, second question is, if it were indeed to come to this uh, type of uh, situation, you know, what might be the outcome? On that, I have uh, various issues and uh, various points to make. Uh, I just want to uh, very, very briefly now uh, mention one of my own experiences in a, uh, in a staff exercise in 1983 uh, called uh, Abel Archer, in which uh, the, uh, uh, the actual, the United States and NATO, and of course the US as principal actor uh, especially on the nuclear side within NATO, uh, actually uh, played through in November of uh, 1983, starting on, on, on 7 November and, and prematurely aborted on 11 November, um, what would actually happen. And uh, I was on the NATO side at that time, uh, and uh, we lost it. Uh, we are... <laughs> We got to a point where the orange side, uh, nowadays perhaps better and better known as the red side, uh, actually uh, uh, overran us. Uh, you know, in the, in the matter of uh, three days, uh, on on the basis of conventional attack, and it was then a question of uh, going to the highest uh, level of defense, DEFCON one, and. Uh, looking at the possibility of uh, nuclear intervention. Uh, that was uh, then played through, uh, DEFCON 1 was called, and uh, the uh, actual exercise uh, involved, in fact, the two heads of state at the time, Margaret Thatcher and, uh, uh, and uh, Helmut Kohl on, on the uh, West German side, uh, there was a uh, bunch of discussion over whether or not uh, President Reagan should be involved. Uh, the new, at that time, new national security advisor, uh, Robert McFarlane, uh, made a very strong point saying, let's not do that. That may be totally misinterpreted. So let's not get Ronald Reagan involved. That was probably 
the thing that prevented an actual outbreak of nuclear war at the time. Uh, because it was then at least plausible uh, for uh, the uh, NATO side to say, look, this is a staff exercise, not the case of uh, what the Russians called RIAM, uh, which means uh, nuclear missile attack, first strike nuclear missile attack. Um, I hope that I will never be, as an observer, <laughs> certainly not as a participant, uh, be involved in this kind of situation. Uh, it was uh, scary as hell. And it made a lasting impression, I think, on everybody who was involved in it, including on uh, President Reagan at the time, uh, who uh, uh, believed that this was the need, this defined the need for getting rid of the uh, mutually assured destruction doctrine, otherwise known as MAD, and actually going for a defensive posture. Okay, well, that's where we stand. So uh, maybe we divided uh, in, in, in the in two parts, uh, potential causes of war and, uh, you know, what to do about it to prevent it. Albert, please. Well, sure. Well, th thank you, Uva and, and David. It's uh, great to be on uh, with, with uh, Asia Times. I've, I've been a fan of, a great fan of Asia Times for a long time. Uh, David's work, as well as uh, many others who've written, I think, ahead of the curve as Asia, Asia Times brand is to be ahead of the curve, not only on Asia issues, but strategy more, more broadly. So uh, a pleasure to be on uh, with, with, with you and with the, 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 the Asia Times as, as an institution. Uh, well, I mean, there's, there's a tremendous amount to unpack in, I think, what, what Uva, you, you laid out. I have probably a somewhat different view, but I think maybe just briefly, so, you know, to open up the conversation, I would say I, I do think that the chances of war are real, um, you know, and I think uh, Graham Allison, for whom I have a, a high regard, uh, I don't agree with on many things, uh, including Taiwan, but, um, but I think is right that we are entering a period of, you know, a sort of, a, as the academics say, a, a power transition situation. And that is a, a moment uh, at, at which war becomes possible. I tend to worry a lot more, and I said this to some Chinese counterparts, uh, actually last, I think last week, the week before, I'm more worried about a deliberate decision, uh, which could be a kind of quote unquote misperception. It'd be more of a political or strategic misperception in the way that like Japan mis misassessed uh, US resolve uh, in 1941, rather than a, a derivation from um, accident or mis, kind of a, a misassessment of, of exercises or something. I'm, I mean, we're in a different, very different world from a kind of military posture and strategic posture point of view than 1983. I, my understanding of 1983, you, you participated in directly, but my understanding is that the, 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 the chances of a major war were less than are sometimes, um, sometimes thought, but, but that's, you know, that's for historians to, to dispute. But Look, I think China is growing in, in well, has grown enormously in, in power. And I don't need to tell anybody in, in Asia that. I mean, it's patently clear to everybody else, obviously, as Xi Jinping himself points out, quoting, allegedly quoting Napoleon, although it's not clear whether it actually he said it. But if he didn't, he should have. Uh, you know, when China wakes, uh, the world will shake. And of course, the world is now finally shaking, obviously, the People's Republic, China stood up, as, as Mao Zedong said, but now it's really standing up thanks to Deng Xiaoping and the, the opening and so forth. And the rest of us have to deal with it. And, um, you know, we can't know exactly what the Central Committee is planning. I mean, I'm, I, you know, my view is we don't know, the Central Committee itself doesn't know what it will do in, in a few years, maybe even a few weeks. So anybody who speaks as if they have total certainty about what the intentions of future intentions of the Chinese leadership are, I just, I don't find it very credible because you know, intentions can change. And, but what we can say is China is tremendously powerful. Uh, it has e enormous economic weight, but it also has a far, far more capable military, not only a military design for the defense of the PRC itself, which was obviously the primary mission of the PLA for, for most of the, of the history of the, the People's Republic, but also not just for the uh, uh, potential uh, coerced unification of Taiwan with the mainland, but also increasingly a power projection military. That is a military that will be able, like the United States military, to project military power, not only through the Western Pacific and Southeast Asia. Already has a Navy that's larger than the United States. 
I mean, yes, the U.S. has some qualitative advantages, uh, although those are eroding and China seeks to erode them. But also um, it uh, quantity has a quality all its own, as as uh, Stalin liked to put it. And uh, that matters a lot. And of course, China has the, the other accoutrement of a, of a power projection military space architecture, Air Force, et cetera, Marines. So this is this is the reality. And I think we've seen China um, blow through, frankly, many of its old um, evidences of restraint. I mean, the no overseas basing and no overseas operations, the uh, minimal deterrent on its nuclear forces. Of course, the Chinese have a way of, PRC has a way of spinning that. But I think it's pretty evident to all to see that, you know, China is willing to use force. I mean, we can see it at Whitson Reef, the Philippines just recently. Of course, the economic coercion vis-a-vis Australia and uh, against the Indians in Ladakh, uh, you know, with, with lethal force. So this is the reality. And I mean, I'm not, I don't agree with Dr. Kissinger on a lot of things, but where I think he's right is this is basically mostly about power and influence. It's not about ideology. So, you know, I mean, I'm a, a firm believer in US American Republicanism, but I don't think it's, a, it's the job of American foreign policy or the right way to look at foreign affairs primarily through an ideological prism. I mean, ideology makes a difference, but I tend to see it as secondary or tertiary. What's really happening is China's becoming very strong. Even if it had a different system of government, I think we would have problems with it. They might be attenuated, um, but I think they would still exist. And I think it also will make, um, make dealing with China more difficult. So, I mean, my view is that we need to make, we the Americans and others who are concerned about a domineering China, obviously countries like Japan, uh, Vietnam, Taiwan, of course, uh, India, Australia, I think South Korea in many quarters. These countries need to make clear to China that, that, that the use of force would be ill-advised because I think, I think the primary danger to get back to Uva, your point, is that China will assess that the use of military force, of course, coupled with other, um, coupled with other instruments of national power would be a rational course of action. I think that is the primary danger. And I think what Admiral Davidson was saying before he retired a few months ago was look, I mean, China could have a, a, a rational course of action uh, vis-a-vis Taiwan, and we don't, you know, we don't want to get in that position, um, you know. And I, I'm always sort of flabbergasted a little bit among Americans who who think that that's impossible. I mean, the United States itself embarked on a number of ill-advised wars, but nonetheless, wars in the last couple of decades. So it's not like great powers aren't willing to use military force if they think it's in their interest. I mean, we know it from personal, sad personal experience. But I think the best way for us to deal with this problem, as, as I said, the Americans and others, is to make it very clear that China would not benefit in a, in a practical, incredible way that shows that, that we would uh, deny China its ability to turn that into a, a victory of some kind uh, at a reasonable cost. And then from that p- position of strength to look for detente over time. So I not detente in the sense of a kind of a, a weary titan sort of, I think this is dramatically overwrought, these, these discussions of American decline. And I mean, if you just look at the numbers, we're doing a lot better than almost anybody else. So, you know, and China has huge problems as well. So, I mean, I don't take those very seriously, but the reality is that, you know, we don't want to get in, a, in, a, in an existential cage match, I like to call it, with China. We don't want China to miscalculate, but to me, this is the question of balance and we need to be forceful now in order to get to a place where we could have more, um, uh, a more a more detente, a kind of a more relaxed uh, position, but that's from a position of of strength, and we're not where we need to be. So that's my, you know, I think the the chance of war would most most likely come in the in Asia from uh, U.S. inattention and a U.S. unwillingness to be firm. Actually, is where where the primary danger is now. Yeah, right. I mean, I I uh, uh, I, I can see that point of view, and 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 there are significant portions of what uh, you said uh, that, that I actually agree with. But, uh, and one thing is, is, uh, is certain that, uh, you know, deterrence is a necessary element of uh, any kind of peaceful solution. If you uh, show yourself to be uh, weak and unprepared and unable to deal with the situation, uh, then, uh, you know, somebody may think something is rational even when in fact it is not. <laughs> Uh, so uh, you know that that's uh, so I I, I think uh, that that's a critical issue and and uh, on on that one we can certainly agree. I think uh, that's been shown true to be uh, uh, the case in history. 
Um, the, the, the one thing that I think is important here is that uh, for China, the almost certainly the most sensitive issue looking at the, uh, the, the country's history is that it's, it's, it's not a nation state in the ordinary sense, right? It is made up of uh, different bits and pieces, the, uh, uh, the Han ethnic uh, block, uh, has shifted around. Uh, they have uh, actually taken over and let go again of different parts of what is nowadays China during the uh, various parts of history. The one thing that uh, ever since the uh, demise and the, the, the horrors of the decline, as far as China is concerned, of the Qing dynasty is that, uh, you know, Everybody has always tried to break them up into bits and pieces. And uh, those are, I think, at the moment, the critical red lines, uh, not ideological issues, perhaps not economic issues, but uh, does China suspect that the United States or the West, let's put it more broadly, is trying to break it up into manageable pieces as opposed to dealing with what it is right now. And, and there are two, at least, two elements of that. One is uh, Taiwan and the other one is Xinjiang, obviously. And, uh, you know, Xinjiang is a much more recent, if you will, acquisition of uh, China in the 19th century. Uh, Taiwan is, well, uh, you know, we, we all know the history and no need to go into that. But uh, I think this is this is where the red lines actually are. I was very encouraged a couple of weeks ago when Kurt Campbell, who was uh, in charge of this, said that the uh, ambiguity over Taiwan, which is uh, actually the result of uh, you know the United States agreeing in uh, the 1970s uh, to a uh, one China policy. Uh, that uh, the, uh, the, the, the actual uh, assumption on the part of China uh, that uh, Taiwan is part of China, but at the same time, the ambiguity that this doesn't mean you can just sort of march in there and impose uh, your particular policy and politics, uh, that remains the, the, the principal issue, right? And, and a potential to me of war. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think a couple couple thoughts. I mean, I think you put your finger on it. I mean, first of all, I would disaggregate uh, Taiwan in particular, uh, and to some extent Xinjiang, but really Taiwan from the question of whether we're seeking to break up the People's Republic as it exists today. I mean, I don't think there's anybody actively pursuing the breakup of, of the PRC. What I would say to people in Asia and China is it's China is a country of 1.4 billion people. Obviously, the Han are... are developed kind of entity, although they themselves are a result of, of conscious policy, you know, creation over the imperial period and, and since. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I think of China like Jupiter, it exerts a gravitational force that is immense. And frankly, China needs to understand, I mean, in a way, frankly, I, you know, historical analog analogies are always fraught, but I mean, when Germany became a unified entity in the 19th century, it ended up exerting a gravitational force that was so great it created chaos. And I mean, it abetted that it was not purely a passive actor. But I think China needs, and I, I don't think China, the, the leadership today is, is doing this, but when you're 1.4 billion people, you have to take extra precautions not to be menacing because your very fact of existence, especially if you're as powerful and creative and impressive, I think as David rightly puts it, I mean, I'm on David's page, in terms of the capability of the Chinese people and the Chinese economy, that's what makes me worry, you know, is I don't think China's got clay feet. I think they're really, you know, it's China's finally, you know, stood up and now it's going to, it's going to turn into, if not Hong Kong, a lot more like it. And that's 1.4 billion people. And that's a, that's a gravitational fact that China needs to deal with. So China, if China is fearful, it also needs to recognize that, um, that it, it just, it's very existence in the way that Bismarck, I think did recognize. I mean, we can criticize him in other ways, but I think he did understand that the fact of a unified Germany would just create um, fears in the rest of Europe that he at least tried to mitigate his successors did not or did so uh, less well, but, uh, or more poorly. But <clears throat> so I think that's important. And, you know, I mean, to be frank, I think China sometimes, and again, I don't, I don't speak Chinese. I took a little bit when I was a kid, but 
you know, I think China is a civilization unto itself, as you point out. Uh, and it's a huge country. And probably most people in China are thinking about other Chinese and the Chinese sort of mental market in the way that Americans do. You know, if you're in, you know, California, New York, Americans don't see a lot of news from abroad compared to what they think about in their country. But that has a danger because people are mostly reacting just to their own internal market. So again, this is not a critique of China per se, but it's to say China's fears need to also be measured against the fear that they create to go back to Thucydides just as a fact of their power. I mean, that that's a reality. So, um, you know, Taiwan, just to be not, not to get uh, pedantic, but I think it's important. The U.S. one China policy does not actually recognize Ch uh, China's claim over Taiwan. The, the US, what Kissinger said and what the communique said is that, you know, the United States recognizes the Chinese on both sides of the strait. Say there's one China. The U.S. doesn't take a position. Part of the U.S. one China policy, as reflected in Taiwan Relations Act and so forth, and now the six assurances, has been incorporated by administrations of both parties is that we will we, we will look with grave concern upon the use of force to determine the fate of the people on Taiwan. Um, uh, so you know that that's a very important point. And I you know Kirk Campbell's comment the other day about strategic ambiguity, I think for for list, you know any listeners in Beijing, I think they I'm sure have already recognized that the administration, I think to its credit, has sent a number of pretty clear signals that the United States would not just sit by and watch China use force against Taiwan. To the contrary, as the National Security Advisor, Kurt Campbell's boss, said the United States would pursue its Taiwan policy with resolve and clarity. Uh, Secretary of State Blinken said that the United States, I think it would, regard, it would be a major mistake or something like that for China to do something. Uh, and the administration as a whole has said that the United States has a rock solid commitment to Taiwan. And they've spoken of the six assurances. So any, Chinese reckoning that they will get away under the threshold of American intervention with uh, the use of force against Taiwan, I think would be mistaken. Now, for our part, I don't think that the U.S., anybody in the U.S. is talking seriously about independence for Taiwan. I don't, I don't think that's something that U.S. policy is pursuing. Um, so I think there's plenty of room to discuss, but I think there's real worry in the U.S. side because um, we hear uh, first of all, we see the facts, the metal being bent and the capabilities being developed to forcibly subordinate Taiwan, including by, uh, as they say, countering U.S. intervention, the Chinese. We call it A2AD, but China calls it, you know, a counter intervention force. So they're clearly thinking about that. And, you know, there are Google Earth images of U.S. ships being shot at by Chinese test missiles. So, you know, OK, we're big boys. We understand big boys and girls. Um, but that's something that's real. And they have a far more significant capability. And then we hear from Xi Jinping that he's not going to let the Taiwan issue pass on to future generations. And that makes us worried. So our point is not, you know, I don't think we've been changing. I know the Chinese counterparts think differently, but I don't think we've been changing. We, but, but we, the old policy of Henry Kissinger was in a very different era when the PLA had no capability to forcibly subordinate Taiwan. So I, we now live in a different, different era, but the, um, but I think we've, you know, hopefully the American side has communicated pretty clearly that we're not going to just roll over on that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, uh, I, there's no argument with that, and, and thanks for clarifying the, the matter of the uh, <clears throat> of the uh, joint communique there in, in '72 or '73, whenever it was. Uh, but the uh, you know, China does regard Taiwan as part of China, and uh, you know that uh, I think we 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 have to understand sure. that. Uh, no so, uh, and they have also not ruled out the use of force. In fact, they have made it very clear that that's not ruled out. Uh, so, uh, where does that go? Well, let me just go back to your Bismarck comment for a moment. You, you, uh, you like maybe many Americans, are not aware of the fact that uh, one of the things that led to World War One was against Bismarck's will. And that was the uh, annexation of Alsace Lorraine after you know after 1871 when when, when Prussia actually uh, won that particular war hands down in a matter of ultimately days. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the the what is important is that uh, Bismarck as a as the ultimate realist he he had no ideology of any kind. Uh, <laughs> He wanted to build an, a stable nation state uh, called Germany. 
And uh, and he thought that if uh, Alsace was going to be annexed to that, sure. that would be you know the pebble in the shoe, right, forever. And so it turned out. I mean, it had nothing to do with Serbia or Sarajevo or anything like that. That, that was that wasn't the that wasn't the reason. Still trying anyway. to figure out what. I guess we're all trying to figure out anyway, what caused the level one still. <laughs> Although it's relevant, uh, I think. Uh, you know, but, uh, gentlemen. Uh, we want to move to questions in just a few minutes. So if you have a brief uh, summary remark before we get to questions, I'd be grateful. Yeah, I just, I just want to, uh, you know, uh, go back to the, the issue of, of Taiwan uh, and uh, how, you know, and what that might uh, look like and the reason why I mentioned the Able Archer maneuver in the first place, uh, you know, at the beginning. Um, if you look at the actual correlation of forces, if you look at the situation in conventional forces terms, uh, the, the Taiwan military uh, right now is uh, oh, effectively somewhere around 200, 250,000. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you, if you look at that, uh, the capability of that military, you know, it, it, it may be well trained, it may be well equipped, but when all is said and done, uh, it's not going to be any more of a match than the 500,000 West German army that I served in uh, was a match going to be to a massive conventional onslaught uh, from the East Bloc. Uh, that raises the question that if indeed uh, it came to a military confrontation, uh, this would uh, either uh, force Taiwan, or even the United States as a backer of Taiwan under those circumstances, uh, to at least make the nuclear threat. And, uh, you know, the nuclear threat, uh, this has been uh, discussed recently uh, by people whose uh, historical knowledge you may not necessarily uh, regard as accurate, but, but Daniel Ellsberg, for example, uh, you know, went through it. Very smart so, guy. I don't always agree with his judgment. I'll say that. <laughs> but, but, but there's, it, yeah. it is a fact that, that the United States threatened the use of nuclear. Uh, weapons, oh yeah, repeatedly against China. Yeah, you know, yeah. repeatedly against China. And uh, and and my my biggest uh, concern is that uh, just like there might be miscalculations on the part of China. Uh, there could be a serious miscalculation on the part of uh, the West. Uh, well, the West. I mean, I mean the yeah, allies. I'm not sure how relevant the West. Yeah, it's more the, the Asian US allies. Uh, look, look at, you know, so let's just say Japan, Korea, and, uh, and I'm not even sure about Korea, but let's just say Japan and the United States. And, uh, and that, is, that is a real issue uh, to me. I think it's, it's, a, it's a serious problem. And... Uh, Anything that can avoid that kind of confrontation at level of it, I think, should be, you know, foreclosed before we get to it. Totally agree with you, which is why I uh, I'm so keen on ensuring that the United States and Taiwan together have a conventional capability to deny a successful Chinese invasion or blockade, because then we won't get to the nuclear, because it's uh, that that it's totally possible. Uh, and it would be ex the riskiest thing that probably ever happened in the world. So. We'd, we'd all be best off avoiding that. Um, just a couple of brief points, because I know David wants to get to questions. I mean, I think um, I totally agree with you on the alsace Lorraine. I mean, that was, you know, was the, 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 the sort of stick in the craw or whatever uh, of, of, uh, that helped especially, you know, propel the anti-German coalition. So it was a terrible decision by the Germans. But, um, but I think, um, uh, you know, my sense is that, uh, you know, if, if we, um, I kind of lost my, lost my train of thought, but I think the point was that, that, you know, if we can deny China a successful invasion, then they will see that it's not in their best interest in precipitating that conflict. And then they're not going to have a great option. I think the one thing I would, I would say to, you know, especially to Chinese viewers would be that the, the risks of failing are extraordinary. So that is to say, uh, if China tries to use force to forcibly unify with, uh, with Taiwan and it fails, that is going to be terrible for China because countries will not only see that China is dangerous, but also that it's resistible. 
So I think this is one of the things that that we have in our quiver um, going forward. And again, we're not we're not trying to support an independent Taiwan, but the idea being that that China will need to it will need to. This is not going to war against Denmark in 1864 or something. This is a much a much different. And the U.S. shouldn't be discounted, even even though we've we've lagged in 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 focusing on Asia and the China problem. We are finally turning our attention to it, and we do still have the largest military in the world or largest military spending in the world. So. Anyway, I, I know David wanted to get to questions, but uh, uh, you know that's just some brief thoughts. Now, many of the questions, in fact, touch on points you've made, so I'm sure you'll be able to return to them. Uh, as we get to questions of which there are numerous, so we'll try to um, answer as many as possible, I'm obliged to give you a word from our sponsor, namely Asia Times. Uh, we're pleased to offer events like this to the public as free events, but to do so, we need the support of our readers, as indeed does every publication of the world, and like virtually every publication of the world, we live on subscription, so please do take the trouble to subscribe to Asia Times. And uh, with that, uh, first question involves the prospective role of Japan either in terms of its deterrent capacity uh, as a country with longstanding interests in Taiwan and an alliance with the United States, or its response to a, um, a to hostilities in the case of Taiwan. What are the Japanese thinking? What have they been doing? How are they likely to respond? Well, uh, I guess I can jump in on this. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a critical issue. And I think that the decision making of Japan in the next few years is prob probably along with that of Taiwan itself is probably one of the most single important variables in whether this uh, coalition of states that are seeking to balance China will succeed. Um, I Honestly, I think Japan has been woefully derelict and delinquent on uh effectively resourcing. It's part of this anti-hegemonic coalition, as I call it. Um, actually, Uva, you mentioned the West German military. I think that's kind of what we want from Japan uh, is, a, is a role more like West Germany in the post-war era. Um, the reality is that the PRC is the largest economy in the world by, by some measures, and its military is tracking that capability. The United States has a flat defense budget, has unfortunately has distractions in other theaters, and has to project power five to 10,000 miles away. You know, the Japanese government under Abe and under Suga has been very clear that China is their is a fundamental threat to Japanese interests, and yet defense spending remains at one percent. It's com it's completely. Uh, I mean, I actually think it's almost irrational. So I think you know what I've been trying to argue in the Japanese press. Uh, or it goes like this. Japan and Taiwan are like this. So, I mean, you know, there's an arms race going on, but only one side is running the actual race, which is China. So, you know, and I mean, I think, you know, this is, this is, you know, the idea that Japan is a, you know, post-war stuff. I mean, I think I find those arguments kind of ridiculous 75 years later. The, the Bundeswehr was the most sophisticated military in Europe, probably more than the American army, short, just a decade or two after the second world war. So there's no, not, I mean, no countries are going to be really worried about Japan rampaging around you because the Americans won't let them and the Chinese won't let them. But what won't work is if Japan just keeps doing what, it, what, it, what it's doing, 1% defense. Now, the defense minister indicated the other day that they are going to increase above 1%. But I mean, you know, that's, 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 that's way too little too late. They need, I think they should be doubling their defense spending. The question is, you know, Taiwan is clearly critical to the defense of Japan. It's essentially part of the same archipelago. Now, I don't mean that politically, but I mean from a geographic military planning point of view. And that's why it's always been part of the U.S. defense perimeter since the Second World War. It's a big part of it. So if, if, if China were to subordinate Taiwan, it would directly impinge upon the security of Japan. I mean, China would have uninhibited access beyond the first island chain, including the eastern approaches of Japan, cut it off from the South China Sea. And of course, direct, it'd be 100 miles from Okinawa at that point, and also 100 miles from Luzon, for that matter. So my, my point is Japan can increase spending now, or it can wait until uh, Taiwan has already fallen to the Chinese, in which case it'll probably have to increase spending by 10x, uh, if the Chinese let them at that point. That's my question. I don't know whether the Chinese would allow them to do that. So I think Japan's best cor course of action is to double defense spending right now, uh, at a minimum. But We'll see if that happens. 
Yeah, I think I, uh, one of our uh, Asia Times uh, correspondents, Berta Lindner, who is uh, you know, quite knowledgeable about um, the, uh, he used to you know, write for James and so on. So he uh, did an assessment of the um, you know, Japanese Navy at least and said, well, you know, if, if you're gonna look at anything in Japan, uh, the Navy is uh, certainly capable and is capable of building out relatively quickly, and it would probably be the biggest uh, significant contribution, uh, you know, for the uh, defense perimeter. And that, I, I, I think, is uh, something that, uh, you know, is, is useful because the Navy in this kind of situation, again, from, from the, uh, if you look at the situation between, historically, between China and Japan, you know, there, 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 there's a great deal of, of, of uh, hesitancy, I think, on both sides to, to get back into any kind of uh, hot confrontation. And uh, the, uh, uh, but Japan could do very well by building out its Navy very significantly and thereby saying this is defensive. And indeed it is. Right. <laughs> and, you can't uh, invade you China know, with a Navy. Yeah. Right. That, that's right. So that's it. And, uh, you know, I think uh, that there is an opportunity for Japan to do this and do it right. That makes sense. So. Uh, there are several other questions about other parts of, uh, of Asia. Um, uh, one questioner asks about uh, China's increasingly expeditionary military and the possibility of a miscalculation by either a U.S. ally or the U.S., spiral of escalation of the South China Sea, the Chindian border and the Himalayas and so forth. A related question, which I'll fold in, is that the Biden administration's March Interim National Security Strategic Guidance doesn't mention its mutual defense treaty with the Philippines. Uh, where does the Philippines fit into America's strategic posture towards um, towards China. So I would take that as a green light to discuss other countries and geographic situations that might contribute to respective hostilities. Should I go or? Go Please. ahead. Yeah. Please okay. go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, I think based on how David uh, has framed it, I think now those are putting the finger on. I mean, look, I think, again, I, I look at it through kind of realistic points of view. I mean, most of the discussion of China tends to talk about intent or ideology, but the simple fact of the matter, I mean, China will have three aircraft carriers by the middle of the decade. And of course, amphibious forces and air assault, space architecture. I mean, you build a robust military space architecture because you want to see far from your shores, right? Otherwise you could use ground-based systems like over the horizon radars. So whatever the Chinese are saying, what they're developing is a military that will be able to project power over long distances. And of course, clearly in the South China Sea and the Western Pacific as well as I think the Indian Ocean to some, some extent. In fact, they've already conducted, I think, a nuclear attack submarine patrols uh, in the Indian Ocean. So that's the reality. And you know, who knows what they'll think in five years, but I mean, with Xi Jinping in power plausibly, it's reasonable to think they're not going to be extremely, uh, cons you know, conservative or, or Deng Xiaoping like. So that's that's the reality. And I don't think miscalculation is really the problem. I mean, I think it's more that, the, you know, I think we can see what China's strategy is right now. Um, you know, hide and bide is dead. Nobody obviously believes in hide and bide anymore. And so the Chinese can't really go back to it because once you've left it, you're not very credible going back to it. So really what I think China's trying, you know, the good news for people on the American side and, and Japan and so forth is there is this kind of coalition forming, right? I mean, the quad is, I think sometimes is overhyped, but it's a good thing. You know, US, Japan, Australia, India, uh, some others here and there, you know, there are people worried about China being domineering and, and kind of bossing everybody around and pushing people around in the region as, as uh, Yang Jichi, I think said to the uh, ASEAN, you know, we're a big country, you're a small country, you're supposed to do what you're told more or less. Um, uh, you know, I think China recognizes that and is basically, uh, instead of using sweetness and light, is relying a bit more on uh, force and threat and inducements, of course. Yes, money, but also, you know, the wolf warrior diplomacy and force. And of course, there's a sense in which, oh, that's going to backfire. But actually, I think it could work. That's what I'm worried about, <laughs> you know, because, for instance, the Philippines, you know, without the United States, it's completely prey to the Chinese military, right? Or 
And the, and the Chinese are so bold and confident, they're even taking on the Indian <coughs> military in, in Ladakh, which I think sends a signal throughout the region that, you know, if they're willing to take on the Indians, nobody, you know, Vietnam or whoever, Indonesia, you, you know, you better watch out. And I think the message that, that they're trying to send, which is not stupid, is, uh, you know, get in, stay in line or else. And so our, you know, our, our responsibility is to make sure that countries have enough, countries that we're allied with in particular in Taiwan have enough confidence to help balance China. Again, not to push China around, but to get China to stay within, you know, its side of the line, if you will. So I think that's the problem. But the problem is they're going to have a military going forward that's going to be able to present that, make that a lot more difficult, you know, because all those A2AD systems that are used for Taiwan, they're also relevant for Philippines or, or Vietnam. I mean, the Chinese already have operational control of the South China Sea in peacetime, right? So, I mean, they've got huge military bases. Some of the artificial islands in the South China Sea, which Xi Jinping told Barack Obama were not going to be militarized, are larger than the District of Columbia. So, I mean, we're not talking, it's not a people's war kind of military anymore. Now, the Philippines MDT, uh, the Philippines is critical because the, if for nothing else, the geography is critical. I mean, in terms of U.S. access across the Central Pacific and the ability to operate in the first island chain, it's obviously critical. And it's been a real source of frustration that we haven't been able to move forward in re-establishing our, our, our posture there, uh, you know, given the political conditions. So this is a real, a real problem. And, and unfortunately, there's some degree of opportunity for China. Uh, I think it's a big mistake that, and it's something I'd point out a lot. I think one of the problems with the very ideological take that the Biden administration is pursuing that I think comes from the president himself, who's a true believer. I mean, he just said, in his Memorial Day speech that, you know, the central thing is democracy is a threat, a home and abroad. I mean, they really see it through that lens. Well, I mean, the Philippines doesn't get very high ratings from Freedom House, but you know what? Neither does Vietnam, neither does Malaysia, neither does India, neither does Singapore, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, what's our, my view is, look, we love Republicanism at home. We always stand for Republicanism and, and dignified treatment of people. But our main point here is to ensure that, that there's a, a balance of power so countries don't get dominated. And I think that's a mistake. So I don't know what they were signaling. I, I do think there's some, I mean, the whole, you know, issues with India, issues with the Emirates and Saudi Arabia. I don't know where the Biden administration, I think they're aware that they probably went overboard in the first couple of months, but we'll see how they, where they end up, because I think that the president and Secretary of State Blinken seem very, they're very ideological on, on this stuff. And I don't think that's the right assessment of the international, uh, international environment. Yeah, I'll just, uh, David, if you allow me to briefly yes, of course, go ahead. Sim simply reinforce the last few lines of uh, Elbridge there. I, I think it's, uh, uh, it is absolutely essential that if this is, if this is going to be resolved, especially in the Asian theater, uh, uh, whether it's uh, Filipinos or Koreans or uh, you know, India, I'm not, not so sure sometimes about the influence of religious and ideological issues. But as far as the rest of Asia is concerned, th this really ultimately comes down to a pragmatic situation of, you know, uh, how do we fare in this kind of a game? And, uh, you know, we, we, we are a country, we are a nation, we have aspirations and we want to be able to pursue them. And, you know, don't screw with us. And I, I, I think uh, you know, that's, uh, that, that, that's a situation that uh, I think uh, both China and the United States have to understand. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, the sometimes overbearing the US presence in the Philippines has obviously created uh, issues. Uh, it has created issues in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. And uh, to the extent that, you know, China is now encroaching, albeit with fishing fleets, you know, on the Philippines is, is not making them any friends either. So uh, this, this, is, this is an important thing. I, mean, I think the, when we're looking at solutions in the Asian uh, area, uh, the pragmatic element of that, uh, to the extent that it is emphasized, the realistic, as we would call it in the European uh, historical context, you know, would make a lot of sense. Uh, <clears throat> a listener asks about uh, the so-called uh, Chinese doctrine of unrestricted warfare. By way of background, this was um, 
a theme in an obscure book by a couple of Chinese colonels uh, published 20 years ago. It was made uh, popular by Michael Pillsbury in his book, The, uh, the 50 Year Marathon. Uh, and it alleges that China is going to use every um, possible method to uh, subvert the West and undermine our power in all kinds of ways. Uh, uh, I don't know if uh, uh, the panelists have a view. Uh, I will, however, say something about it, which is that if you read the book, which is freely available uh, on the internet, uh, the two colonels, uh, Lao and Wang, argued strongly that China should not invest in high-tech military equipment because that didn't work for the Russians who lost the Cold War. What the Chinese did, what the People's Liberation Army did, was the exact opposite of what Lao and Wang represented, and both of them were sent out to pasture as academics rather than promoting the PLA. So uh, just as a matter of fact, I don't believe that this idea of unrestricted warfare has any relevance at all to what we're talking about. And to make a big deal of it just increases paranoia in a way that isn't helpful. Uh, that's my view, but uh, Bridge or Uba, if you'd like to comment, please go ahead. No, I, I, I agree with you. I, I, I think uh, that was, uh, you know, a, a kind of uh, derivative of uh, Mao's uh, People's War, which was successful and all the rest of it. But, you know, the, uh, uh, even at the time of uh, uh, Kimoy and Matsu, when, uh, you know, the uh, United States made the uh, nuclear threat, uh, China pulled back. Uh, so, uh, you know, no, nobody, nobody, I think, in China or, you know, then or now uh, would want to risk uh, a situation in which you say, we have 1.4 million people and you have whatever, 300 some million and, uh, you know, you can kill four out of us, you know, for each one of you. And I, 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 I this is gone. I don't, I don't think this is at all where, where China is right now. I think this is uh, something that should be put to rest. Well, I know I agree. I mean, I think they're building a military that's designed for, you know, localized war under informationalized conditions, as I think is the term in English, which is, you know, basically designed. I mean, I think they are, from what we can see, you know, in the public, I think they're developing the capability to, to inflict real hurt on the United States and others. But I think, you know, frankly, the Marxists, I mean, again, I'm not, I mean, well, the CCP, they are Marxist Leninists, and Xi Jinping does seem to be a Marxist Leninist, even if I don't think ideology is the central reality in international politics. That that is true. Um, but you know, they they studied Clausewitz, right? I mean, I think Lenin was a student of Clausewitz, right? I mean, so they under and you know, we experienced this hellishly in Korea where the connection of military operations to political objectives. So I, I mean, you know, and it's in, in, you know, the infamous incident with the general saying to Chess Freeman in the 90s, you know, you, you wouldn't trade Los Angeles for Taipei. Not only didn't work, it, didn't, it sort of backfired on China, you know, so I, I don't think those kind of incredible threats are going to work. I mean, I think the Chinese are pursuing ad advantage in every domain of national power, but I don't, you know, so what else is new, right? <laughs> um, a Japanese listener asks what the prospective role of Russia would be in the event of hostilities in the Pacific. Well... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. You go ahead first. <laughs> okay. Well, look. I think the role of Russia. I mean, it's it's an anomaly in in so many ways, sort of from a geopolitical point of view. I mean, uh, clearly, this extremely tight relationship, historically speaking, between China and Russia, is an anomaly when China is so powerful and and the. You know, obviously, it's the the intense alienation of Washington from Moscow, and and also most of the Western, or actually all of the European capitals from Moscow. And you know, Russia's done a lot of horrible things. Um, but I think the fact is that over time, especially if China is becomes more powerful and is able to pursue this strategy I kind of laid out advantageously, there will become a growing degree of convergence of interests between this coalition and Russia. At, you know, obviously from the coalition side and people in Japan and Vietnam and India are perfectly understand this, that, you know, we have an interest in Russia being along for the ride to help balance China and distract it. 
uh, et cetera, but also from Russia's point of view, because look, I mean, if the Chinese are willing to, to use force against Vietnam and India and the Philippines and Taiwan and Japan and Australia to some, you know, in various degrees, well, you know, that's, and there's not a lot of love lost in that, in that historical relationship. I mean, the reason that, that Mao decided to pursue the nuclear program after the Taiwan Straits crisis was because he thought the Soviets had betrayed him. And, and in 1969, Mao ordered the evacuation of Beijing because he was afraid of a Soviet first strike. So it's not like this is a written in stone. Um, but I think, you know, we have to deal with, you know, we who think this way have to deal with the reality that there is an intense political alienation. My view actually is that we should kind of draw a firm line in the West and eventually Russia will, will see its interest in having a, 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 a sort of an option with this coalition, even if that doesn't mean a full reconciliation that at least means a distancing from, from China that would be advantageous to, I mean, you know, the U S and China were not allies in the latter part of the cold war, but the Soviets had to put several hundred thousand troops on the, in the Soviet, in the Russian far East to, to face off against the PLA. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I, I think there is, um, you know, demographic and, uh, geographical reasons why, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, Russia or Siberia will always be attractive to uh, a uh, population mass of 4.1 billion <laughs> to the south. Uh, you know, the, the, the vacuum attracts, uh, you know, that kind of attention. But uh, let, me, let me just mention a totally different point. I, I, you know, because ultimately what people do, whether it's, you know, war or anything else, it's a question of intent. And uh, in, um, in 1990, when uh, the Germany is unified, um, 50,000 soldiers of the uh, uh, NVA, the National People's Army of East Germany, joined the Bundeswehr, the uh, West German uh, military forces. I, I was uh, long no longer active in, in, in the military, but I was still uh, in, in the uh, reserve. And, and had, had therefore, you know, the ability to talk to people and understand what's going on and so on. And uh, whether it was uh, the former East Germans or the Russians, who uh, we at that point had very direct access to, and, and it was very open in the early years, uh, 1990, 1992, three, four, uh, I had a lot of interesting discussions. and. Uh, and it's very clear, I think, that even Putin at the outset of this, you know, basically wanted to be a Westerner. His, his ambition was, uh, you know, let, let Russia become part of Europe as opposed to be principally oriented toward Asia to the extent that, that there is uh, a different way of, you know, the so-called Eurasian view and so on and so forth. Uh, I think it's a very artificial one. It's still not going to last. I think the, the, the actual opportunities, if they were to be presented, and that's, I know, to have been the German policy of the current government, of the Merkel government, is simply do not push Russia away from us to a point where they will simply have no choice but to go somewhere else. And, uh, and therefore, you know, I think uh, what, what, what happens in Asia, whether between Japan and China, Japan, and, Japan cannot move away from China, okay? They're, they're sitting there. <laughs> uh, and, and they have to find a way of living one way or another uh, or dying with China. But they cannot just move it away. But, but, but Russia, when all is said and done, I think, most people, uh, most Russians who are not just uh, Eurasian ideologues, uh, you know, will tell you that, you know, this, this, this has to be the Russia of Peter the Great and not the Russia of anything else. And Peter the Great was a Dutch guy. Okay? <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, this, there, there are a lot of uh, strange assumptions being made and, uh, the idea that Russia would take sides in a uh, military confrontation, I think they would make every damn possible effort to prevent that from happening in the first place. 
Thank you. It's now uh, 10 o'clock, but with everyone's indulgence, we'll go for another 15 or 20 minutes and try to uh, attend to the rest of the questions. Uh, one listener asks, uh, I, I'm putting words in his mouth, if we can't beat them, why not join them? Why doesn't the United States join with China and support the Belt and Road Initiative and the development of all these technologies in economic development and do this jointly instead of viewing them as doing this as a contest? Well, I mean, I think human nature and this, the dictates of, of systems and how people behave. I mean, you, you don't, concerts like that don't work. These sort of G2 ideas don't work. I mean, look at the post-Cold War period or post-Napoleonic period. The incentives to push for advantage become too great. And I think you can see it happening. Frankly, you could see it in the United States after the end of the Cold War. In a lot of ways, we, had, we were kind of restrained during the Cold Wars in, in some respects uh, uh, in sort of our aggressive liberalism by the, by the dictates of structure, by the fact that this, we had to focus on the Soviets. And after the Cold War, you know, I mean, I, was, I think actually there's probably some Madeleine Albrights in the Chinese system right now. If we have this great military, why can't we use it? Um, and I think, you know, if we tried to, to get, you know, to, to do this kind of G2, well, then there would inevitably be disputes about who had the advantage where, and one side would think it would have more power just like in any business negotiation or any partnership, right? Um, and 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 that would lead to its its um, its uh, its its decay. And and the problem with that situation is it's not just like you can try and fall back because if you if you're not prepared for the fallback, then you're going to lose basically. And the basic reason is that I think that China's and I mean we can sort of see it. I mean, it's not doesn't take a lot of speculation, but China I think wants to create a large area over which it's kind of hegemonic particularly a kind of a market area in which countries have to sort of, you know, I mean, the classical term would be the kowtow. I mean, obviously it's archaic, but basically have to take a, you know, a buy or leave from Beijing on critical national security or, or economic decisions that tr the whole trade system and the regulatory system would be oriented around China, that standards would be set in China, you know, that, that, the, that the, prime, the, the commanding heights of the international economy would be in China. And I mean, you know, frankly, that's, that sounds pretty great. I could understand why Chinese would want to pursue that, but it's not in our interest, not in Japan's interest, not in India's interest, not in Vietnam's interest, not in Australia's interest, and frankly, it's not in Europe's interest. So I think that's sort of the basic reason is that we kind of like, we can see where this would go. So let's, my, my whole view is like, we can see where this would go if we aren't prepared. So let's get prepared now, take the pain and friction, keep it below the level of conflict, if at all humanly possible, uh, but not if we, but if we can't avoid it, be ready for it. Um, and then get to a point, a position of strength where we can have a balance. You know, I mean, I think to, to take Uva's historical, you know, about the end of the Cold War, I mean, and I think the foreign minister of Germany completely misses this point for the foreign minister Moss. I mean, the reason that could happen, why that intention could actually manifest was because of people like Uva who were serving on the inner German border, not to mention the U.S. nuclear deterrent. Without that, you know, I mean, there, speaking of 1983 Germany, one of my favorite strategic documents, and David, you and I might have talked about this, but is the German defense white paper the Kohl government released in 1983. It's a brilliant exposition of how in the nuclear era, the Soviets had basically their strategy was to try to develop a military that could then basically kind of extract rents from West Germany and create a kind of Finlandized West Germany that would kind of follow its rules. Defeating that strategy by having the military buildup of the 1980s that David played such an important role in, that was critical to then, then enabling, okay, well, Russia's best, the Soviet's best decision at that point was to seek, a, and I don't think this is likely to happen with China, but seek a kind of a transformational relationship because they couldn't go on. But that, it, you know, they, if, they, if they could have extracted the rents from West Germany, as David points out, they could have gone on. And so, you know, we want to we wanted the position with China where they're incentivized. I mean, I, the only, the, 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 the sort of, counterpoint I'd make to Uva's point is intent matters, but intent is, uh, takes place within a framework. Of, I mean, you guys are all businessmen, so this is old hat, but intent takes place within a, a framework of cost and benefit and risk. And so we want to frame that. So China's best strategy is one that we can live with. Yeah, look, I, I, I think uh, uh, on, on that thing, it's, it's not, you know, this guy joining that guy or this guy joining that guy. I mean, there, there are, uh, you know, cultural historical differences of massive significance here, right? Uh, there, uh, 
there was a German philosopher, Leibniz, who uh, thought that the Chinese way of writing uh, things was marvelous because it was transparent to language, right? It, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, so you could have written German or Chinese in, in, in Chinese characters. And uh, he, he just loved the idea. But, you know, I, I suppose if he had actually gone to China at the time and, and had been asked whether or not he loved the idea of living there, that might have been a different response. I, I don't know. And uh, the, the, uh, the, the situation is that uh, what we have, have to aim for is a, a realistic outcome in which the aspirations of China and of the United States, uh, you know, actually can be pursued without leading to an actual, you know, hot military confrontation. And uh, it, it just appears to me that uh, there are a lot of avenues to, to uh, prevent that from happening. I just think that, I mean, I, I, I know you don't like, you, know, you don't like the, the term miscalculation, but I, I don't mean accident. Well, miscalculation is okay. Yeah, yeah, no, mis I, that's a good term. It's more like yeah. accident that I don't like so much. But, right, I mean, accident. I, I agree with you. That's that's not yeah. that's not what I'm talking about. But yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. It's sort of egregious miscalculation that leads to a confrontation that, with any you know bit of sense of pragmatism, could have been avoided. And and I think that's completely. Yeah. Sort of, that's that's the best thing we can aim for. I mean, I, I don't. But yeah. No, Can I say on that? Because I think you're right. And yeah. just briefly, I mean, I actually think miscalculation is the problem. And that's why I think that we need to be clear and capable because I think the most, I mean, this is all, nobody knows. There's no right answer because it's all, I don't know, dependent on uh, you know, interactive. But I completely agree. I mean, go back to the World War I example briefly because it is salient. We sort of don't know why it happened. But I would say one of the key points was Germany's miscalculation that Britain wouldn't intervene or I mean, wouldn't intervene sufficiently quickly to make a difference. And, you know, that's, an, you know, world, most of the time people say World War I happened because of too much aggressiveness, but maybe if the Brits had been more forward leaning uh, and even had forces on the continent already, ideally, uh, maybe Germany wouldn't have made that miscalculation, but that was clearly a miscalculation. But, you know, miscalculation, as you know, Uwe, I don't, but I'm just explicating the point, miscalculation can happen in both directions. It can happen because people fear threatened, but also because they feel too much opportunity when it's not actually there. Oh, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Parent, yeah. Parenthetically, I wrote years ago that the real tragedy of World War I is that Germany didn't take the opportunity to get the first Morocco crisis in 1905 to launch a preemptive attack on France when Russia was busy with its revolution and the Entente Cordelle hadn't really, the ink hadn't right. quite dried. Uh, that would have been nasty for France, but at least it would have been over quickly. We wouldn't have had World War I, at least not then in that form. But in any event, that's counterfactual, counterfactual history is uh, best left with fan fiction, I think. Uh, Bridge, before we go on to the next question, uh, mm -hmm. so that our viewers can follow your work better, uh, after leaving the Defense Department, you founded something called the Marathon Initiative. If you want to spend a minute talking about what you're doing now, I think our listeners would like to hear. Great. No, thank you, David. Um, yeah, the Marathon Initiative I founded with my partner and, and good friend, Wes Mitchell, who is the Assistant Secretary of State for Europe at the beginning of the Trump administration. And both of us believe that, you know, there's a lot of great work coming out of the think tanks, but where the gap was, was in a sense what think tanks were originally, I think, designed to do, which was to provide a space for people with policy expertise and background, but also a kind of a rigorous bent of mind to spend a lot of time and have the political sort of organizational freedom and support to do long-term strategic thinking that's sort of rigorous, but also practically valuable to the US government and other friendly governments. And so that's really what we're doing. Uh, the main thing I'd mentioned to your listeners, if they're interested, if they wanna hear me bloviate on more uh, in writing or, or an audio book, I have a book coming out called The Strategy of Denial, American Defense in, in an Era of Great Power Conflict from Yale University Press will be available uh, in September, but that that's the, the main kind of fruit of, of the last couple of years since leaving the Pentagon in a way, uh, or you kindly mentioned the national defense strategy. I mean, that's a, a bureaucratic document. I think we, we did, hopefully did a, made some progress, but this is the sort of, I, since we're talking about philosophers, I kind of think of it as the, the platonic version uh, in a way, you know, no, no bureaucratic or linguistic compromises, but uh, uh, anyway, that people might be interested. 
Thank you. Uh, and of course, if you'd like to give us a preview of the pages of Asia Times or, uh, are open to you. Thank you. Uh, one more question, and I think this might be the last. Uh, one of our listeners is a businessman uh, active in China who agrees with the Michael Pettis thesis, mm. namely that China is going to enter a period of extremely slow growth. I have to disagree with that, but it certainly is a well-argued thesis, uh, which not just uh, Professor Pettis, but many other people share. Uh, hypothetically, assuming that that thesis is correct, how would that affect the strategic discussion we've been having? Well, this well, is something me, I've been... Uh, oh, no, go ahead, yeah. over. Sorry. Please. Yeah, no, I just, it just so happens that I know Michael quite well. And, and uh, you know, we've, we've often had uh, the opportunity to sit around in a small little uh, Japanese uh, bar in, uh, in Simchatsoi here in Hong Kong and, um, and talk about this. Uh, Mike, Michael is a, uh, uh, a, 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 a astonishing guy. I mean, he, uh, he has uh, been teaching at the Peking University, uh, you know, which is the Harvard of China. And, uh, you know, that's not uh, trying to diminish Harvard. Uh, and, well, uh, <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll leave comment. David and I can talk about it another time about the status of elite education in the United States. But anyway. That's, uh, <laughs> uh, Michael is a contrarian. And, uh, uh, and, and hmm. Michael is also uh, very much a sort of a, 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 a Keynesian's, Keynesian guy with, good with the numbers and all the rest of it. I, I think what he overlooks, and I've told him that all the time, is that uh, what's driving the Chinese economy at this point is, is got nothing to do with this thing of, you know, you reach middle age and then you sort of uh, slow down. I mean, I, I think uh, China is not slowing down. I, I think China is uh, economically uh, making the most optimal use of its resources to uh, technologically advance and to spread the uh, technological advances in the uh, you know sort of broad uh, economic uh, development and and that's where I, I I think Michael is wrong but you know he he uh, he, he is a, a very persuasive guy. Well, I'll just say I mean I. I'm, I'm actually, you, you gentlemen know a lot more and I think the viewers do as well. Actually, I'd love to hear your uh, greater length sometime. Um, my instinct is, is with you. I mean, I, you know, Uva, I think touched on at the end. I mean, if nothing else, China still has hundreds of millions of people, if not in poverty, then something not so far from it. So, I mean, just bringing those people out is a pretty good, pretty good basis for continued growth. I mean, it's not, you know, Europe or Japan where you have a population that's largely already kind of you know, upper income, and now you have to have fundamental breakthroughs. But he could be right. I mean, I think as a sort of foreign policy strategist, I mean, my view is we should be prepared for the, the range of outcomes, obviously, particularly the kind of more plausible ones. I've been thinking about this for some time. I think the strategy that I'm laying out is, is, is actually resilient across those outcomes, because if, if Uva and David are right, then we're on the right trajectory, which is we're prepared. Uh, you know, but not not so provocative that we're, you know, China thinks that we're trying to, you know, burn the summer palace kind of thing. Um, but we're prepared. And it's going to be somewhat expensive, but we'll defray the costs across and we're trying to be we're, we're fundamentally a defensive military position. If Michael is right, uh, Michael Pettis is right, then worst case, we've wasted some money on the military. But I'd rather have that than the reverse, which is under prepare and have China achieve domination of, of Asia and from that position, global preeminence in the interest of, I guess, saving money on defense in the, in the near term, especially given that our, our rate of expense, and I'm not a sort of theological at all in terms of increasing the defense budget. I want to keep it as low as, as feasible, but no lower um, in a sense. But, you know, I mean, we're spending around 3%, which is a much, much lower than we spent in the Cold War and Japan could spend a lot more. So, so I think this is, um, you know, I'd rather I'd rather err on the safe side, given the range of potential outcomes. Yeah, I, I just uh, a quick footnote on that. I you know there, I forgot the guy's name, but there's been a uh, professor at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, economics professor, who for 
uh, the past uh, two decades uh, has been questioning the uh, the, the, the growth of uh, the GDP of China and it couldn't have possibly been as high as a result of that. And uh, I, I, I met the guy at some point, and I, you know, in, the, in in New York, I guess it was at some conference or seminar or whatever. And I asked him, "Have you ever been to China recently?" He said, "No." I said, well, look, uh, I, I, I sort of live there, at least across the water. And uh, there, there, there is no bloody way in which uh, the GDP could have been wrong and Shenzhen could have been built. Okay? Uh, and, 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 you know, you, all you need to do is look at what is actually happening in China. And, uh, you know, to, to see, yes, there, of course, there's always going to be a slowdown of some sort. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, there's no question about it. Just like there's a slowdown in economic, economic growth, there's a slowdown in population growth. China is struggling with that right now. And it's got nothing to do with the one or three uh, member or whatever children family. It's got something to do with the fact that when you reach, you know, middle class or when, you know, one third or two thirds of your population reach upper middle class status, yeah, well then, you know, that slows down, you know, you have fewer children. That's, we've seen that everywhere. <laughs> you know, so uh, anyway, the, so Michael, I appreciate his, uh, Michael Pettis, his uh, views at the same time, I think China is on a different path. And with that, gentlemen, uh, I thank you for a really enlightening, lively, and informative discussion. I'd like to thank our many listeners uh, who tuned in and particularly those who submitted questions. We'll be back, we'll be back to you shortly with uh, another webinar announcement for mid-June, so uh, stay tuned and please do subscribe to Asia Times. Uh, with that, many thanks again, and we'll close this session. Thank you very much, Alvin. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Oliver. You. Thanks, David. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you, Alvin. All right. Bye bye.